Hello everyone, welcome to UGC 112, World Civilizations 2. This is lecture 19, Society, Science, and Culture in Late 19th Century Europe. So, earlier this semester we looked at how the early Industrial Revolution changed the lives of people. Um, remember, people had to move from the farms to the cities. Uh, we did get into a little bit of societal changes with the rise of the industrialists, but in this lecture we're going to focus on how uh, as the Industrial Revolution continued on, how society and culture and science uh, changed with it. Of course, some of the changes in this lecture are also going to be highly influenced by um, the revolutions that we just looked at, uh, looked at in the last lecture, right? Um, remember, 19th century Europe has all of these liberalizing uh, revolutions and counter-revolutions. So, of course, those are going to have um, some influence on cities. As we always do, uh, when we talk about change, we have to look at what came before. So, what did a typical medieval city look like in Europe? Usually they were built along a river. Here's our river there. And this river was their water source not only for drinking, but for washing and sewage as well. So, you know, this river does all those um, things, making it a little bit perilous, right? Um, you know, you're drinking, but it's also going to be a source for sewage and washing, so not the cleanest. Most of the cities had defensive walls. Uh, we could see in this city here, there's our defensive walls. And these were kind of necessary against the armies of the Middle Ages. Over time, they became a little more obsolete with the rise of gunpowder. We can even remember uh, Constantinople's walls couldn't keep out the Ottomans. They did a pretty good job, but those were amazing walls. So as gunpowder, you know, becomes more effective and wider used, walls become more and more obsolete. Within the walls of these medieval cities, generally 30 to 60,000 people um, would be packed in there. Uh, to give you some idea, in around 1550, London was around 74,000 people, uh, so that's right after the reign of Henry VIII. Um, by the time Elizabeth was reigning in 1600, it had already bloomed up to 187,000 people. The Paris that was worth a mass to Henri IV was around 245,000 people in 1600. Um, and just to give us some modern perspective, both of those cities are smaller than the city of Buffalo is today. You know, the city of Buffalo proper, uh, which houses around 260,000 people. So these massive cities for the time, you know, definitely not the norm. Um, like I said, 30 to 60,000 people were the normal cities, um, are still smaller than Buffalo proper is today. During the Renaissance and the Industrial Revolution, especially early on, uh, the walls that these cities had kind of acted as a small impediment to growth. And these cities, especially in the Industrial Revolution, certainly were growing a great deal. Uh, those walls kind of made it so that there was less room to grow out, and that made it so that cities had to grow upwards. Um, but that's kind of always been the case. Even when they were fitting 30 to 60,000 people, cities had much larger buildings, like we could see this here, uh, than you would find in the countryside. But now, of course, obviously, if we're trying to fit all these people into the same area, roughly, uh, we're going to have to grow up more and more, right? The building up of cities meant that it was usually dark in the streets, um, especially because buildings often kind of hung over the street. And we could see, so the, here are some buildings that are going up, but then at the same time, they're also going out over the street, blocking the sun. And you add into the fact that, you know, these streets aren't very wide in general. So, you know, these taller buildings are nestled right together. Not really well planned at all. Usually they just kind of formed as the city grew, you know, any path 
that was being used became, yeah, the road. And these roads really didn't accommodate much more people than, you know, much, much more than people and maybe a cart or two. Adding to the do darkness was smoke from the chimneys of houses. Uh, so it, it was a pretty, pretty dark place. Obviously, the smoke would become, you know, a much greater concern during the Industrial Revolution when you have all these factories spewing it out as well. There also really wasn't much public lighting in these dark streets. Um, and in general, there weren't really any public services. Things like police and fire departments, garbage collection, even sewers, uh, didn't exist in these middle ages, uh, medieval cities. The few cities that were lucky enough to have sewers either had, you know, ancient Roman sewers that were, you know, usually clogged up or not adequate for, not, you know, in adequate condition for the, the people that were there. Um, or they had sewers that were just kind of open channels along the streets. So the, the dirty water and sewage is just sitting there out. In terms of jobs, there were small little craft shops and stores, uh, things like manufactories that could, you know, that would make goods, usually had about two to ten people working in them. So there were some jobs, but they were on a very, very small scale, especially compared to what we're going to see as, uh, or what we will see as these cities grow in the Industrial Revolution. So like I said, as the Industrial Revolution grew and developed further, so did these cities. Uh, the rivers that had earlier served as drinking, washing, and sewage now also were a power source for factories, uh, especially the, you know, the water-powered factories. And even when steam developed, they provided the water that was needed for producing steam. They also became you know, channels for removing the byproducts of factories. So the, the rivers already polluted um, during the, middle, mid, uh, the medieval times now are even more polluted as the Industrial Revolution continues on. So around 1800 we're looking at. These cities that once held 30 to 60,000 people by 1800 were holding roughly a hundred to two hundred thousand people and these numbers would continue to grow by 1900 cities could reach close to five hundred thousand people in England in 1800 just to give you like an example 1.5 million people in the entire country lived in cities that was roughly 17 percent of the population in 1851, that number of the people living in cities rose to 6.3 million, which was 35%. And in 1891, 15.6 million people lived in English cities. And that was a whopping 54% of the people. <clears throat> and remember London, uh, you know, we looked at it in 1600, that, you know, very, very large city that with 187,000 people during Elizabeth's reign. Around 1800, London reached one million people. It was one of only two cities that was, had a million people, the other being uh, Beijing. By 1900, London would reach nearly six and a half million people. That's in a hundred years. Five and a half million people have moved in to London. And, you know, if we're talking about in a span of 300 years, we're going from 187,000 people to 6.5 million. In many of these cities, more and more people were crammed into, you know, space that was originally designed for a very small population compared to what was being, you know, crammed in. And you have to remember that many of these cities had those walls and the existing streets that, you know, weren't planned out. The, the, the streets weren't planned out. The walls were there. So all these people are held in tightly 
you know, and there's not really much room for movement. Uh, these cramped conditions and the new pollutants from the Industrial Revolution created a lot of new health hazards. When we talked about the Industrial Revolution earlier, you'll remember there was a rise in tuberculosis and emphysema from people working in the factories, but those weren't the only diseases that were prevalent. One of the major diseases of the time was cholera. We know now that it was caused by uh, that it's caused by a bacteria, uh, Vibrio cholerae, and it infects the small intestine. This made it very easily to spread through water. Um, the fact that it was this bacteria, of course, doctors at the time didn't know this. In fact, what they thought was causing cholera was miasma, or bad air. And this may sound silly now, but you kind of have to think about the world that they were living in. These cities were filled with smoke and garbage and feces everywhere. The smell was horrific. At the same time, germ theory and the idea of bacterial infections, those weren't really prominent. They weren't, you know, well accepted. So, you know, they're, they're basically going with what they know. Uh, the, the idea of miasma has been around, had been around for ages. And like I said, the cities were terrible smelling places. So bad air isn't as crazy as it might seem. The symptoms for cholera included fever, aches in the limbs, stomach cramps, and most notably, diarrhea. Now, this diarrhea was so intense that it causes um, severe dehydration, which can kind of give your skin a bluish tint. So we see here this nice fair maiden kind of being reduced by the dehydration to this bluish, almost ghoulish looking lady. Um, yeah, it's kind of scary. And this can all happen in a matter of hours after exposure, these symptoms. The diarrhea also spread the disease uh, because wherever the feces was, the bacteria was as well. And if something splashed on you and, you know, somehow made it into your mouth, you could then get cholera. Now again, it's important to recall that in these cramped early industrial cities, the rivers were sewers as well as drinking water. Sewers. So the feces is getting there, and some of these feces have this bacteria. That leads to the spreading of the disease as well. The Thames was the major river. It's the river in London. Um, in the 1800s, this river was filled with sewage, factory byproducts, even bodies of animals and people. And you can kind of see there's some animals there. Uh, lovely drawing of death floating along in his boat along the Thames River. So, yeah, there were actually people, the, the, the urban poor of London, um, who would go out onto the Thames and fish out bodies, hoping to find stuff in the pockets, and then, you know, give the bodies over to the police. In 1858, during the summer, the smell coming from the Thames was so bad that Parliament was actually forced to close down for a few months. Um, you know, the, the heat made the, the stench just unbearable. And that actually is called the, the Year of the Great Stink. Uh, that, but that's how bad uh, the Thames was in terms of pollution and how, you know, just awful it was uh, in terms of smell. And you can imagine that this scare, uh, you know, that this great stink would cause quite a scare among the people who believed in the miasmal theory, right? They believe that bad air c can spread the disease, uh, and there was a lot of bad smelling air around. So what we see are kind of people linking 
the Thames to uh, the diseases. Like, here we see diphtheria and uh, scrofula here. Diphtheria is a bacterial infection. Um, scrofula is an infection of the lymph nodes. And then there is our good friend cholera. Um, and this is the Thames, this great polluted water, um, offering them up to the city of London. And with cholera, it was in fact caused by the water, but it wasn't the stench coming off the water. It was coming from the feces in the water, right? There was an epidemic in 1848, and the word epidemic literally means um, across the population, right? Epi meaning across, dem meaning the people or the population. And in all of England and Wales in 1848, 52,000 people died from cholera. 14,137 of those people were in London alone. Um, so it's a pretty big outbreak. In 1854, there was another outbreak. This one was called the Broad Street Outbreak. And a man named John Snow... Wait, wait a sec, not that John Snow. There he is. This doctor, John Snow, um, mapped out where the infected were in the city. Um, so there's the, the real John Snow, the one that we're talking about. And while mapping this out, he noticed that they were clustered around Broad Street. And here we can see there's Broad Street, and there are all these little dots of cases of people, you know, with cholera. By talking to the residents, he determined that the source of this outbreak was a single water pump on Broad Street. Now, the company that operated this pump was Southwark and Vauxhall Waterworks Company, and they said that they were getting their water from a clean source, not from the Thames, because it smelled so bad and people realized that it was really polluted that they didn't want to drink it. So, you know, there were companies that would bring in water, and this company said that they were getting it from a clean source. Actually, they were just drawing it straight from the Thames. Uh, the government removed the handle, and the cases started to go away. This link to the water of the Thames um, really started to help push the questioning of the miasmal theory, right? Um, if it was traced to this water pump, how is it coming from bad air? Um, and here's a fun little fact. The government actually put the handle back on the pump after the breakout uh, because they didn't really want to accept Jon Snow's notion of the way that cholera was transmitted. Um, it wasn't until there was another outbreak in 1866 when the government really started to take Jon Snow's idea that the water was the cause um, very seriously. This here water pump uh, was actually put on Broad Street to commemorate Jon Snow and his work. And you can see in this commemorative water pump, there's no handle there. Even as the outbreaks were happening, uh, Parliament was investigating the causes of disease. Obviously, they were not supporters of Jon Snow and his ideas. You know, they were hoping to find miasmal um, causes. But they were at least investigating it and having reports drawn up about it. The year of the Great Stink in 1858 did convince Parliament to try to control the sewage a little bit better. From 1859 to 1875, a man named uh, Joseph Bezelje, Bezelje, there we go, uh, oversaw the creation of a modern sewer system in London. And you can see the construction of the sewers here. I just love this picture. Here is um, Joseph Basil J, uh, and drawn as a sewer snake. How cool is that? Um, you know, a local newspaper 
drawing him as this sewer snake. On top of the building of sewers, uh, the government also tried to regulate uh, drinking water. So during the same time as these uh, improvements were being made to London, uh, people began to understand diseases better. Germ theory, uh, the idea that, you know, diseases were caused by microorganisms, dated as far back as 1546, actually, and it was improved upon a bit in 1762, and it began to grow more and more popular. So, obviously, microorganisms causing diseases, uh, like our good friend Vibrio, cholera there, um, and this is what we believe today, right? Work like John Snow's obviously helped to discredit the old miasmal theory, uh, and the work of some other scientists would then support this germ theory. One of these scientists was the Frenchman Louis Pasteur. In the 1860s, he was studying fermentation with a microscope. And he realized that microorganisms were what caused certain drinks to spoil. He also found that through a way of heating up these drinks, uh, he could kill these microorganisms. This process uh, would become pasteurization, named after him. You know, we still use pasteurization for milk uh, and beer. Because of his research on fermentation, Louis Pasteur believed that if microorganisms could spoil drinks, they could do harm to the body as well. Thus he proposed people should try to prevent microorganisms from entering their bodies. Pasteur also worked a lot on immunization uh, with diseases like chicken cholera, rabies, and anthrax. Now his work on anthrax led him into a bit of a scholarly rivalry with a German physician named Robert Koch. Robert Koch had studied the causes of anthrax and he contested Pasteur uh, and the methods that Pasteur used a, a few times. So they kind of had this back and forth um, through scholarly papers. He also studied the causes of cholera and tuberculosis, and his work on tubercul tuberculosis actually earned him a Nobel Prize in 1905. Uh, he got the Nobel Prize. His research was especially groundbreaking in terms of developing bacterial cultures. Um, he figured out a way uh, to cultivate bacterial colonies uh, to study them further. Pasteur's proposal that people should not let microorganisms into their bodies inspired a British surgeon named Joseph Lister um, to try to clean his tools and patients' wounds. And he did this using uh, carbolic acid. Now this may seem, again, you know, like what you should obviously be doing. But previously, surgeons, uh, in order to clean off their tools, would just kind of wipe them off on their well-used, dirty aprons. Um, not surprisingly, then, it was very common for people to contract infections um, from their surgery and die during, uh, while they were recovering. So Lister, you know, begins cleaning these tools with carbolic acid, and due to his antiseptic techniques, the number of infections uh, dropped tremendously. You know, you're using clean tools, those bacteria are not getting in, thus you're not having people get infected. And thus, he kind of became known as uh, the father of modern surgery uh, because of you know, these cleaning, his cleaning procedures. He was so famous that in 1879, a company all the way in St. Louis, Missouri, uh, decided to tie a product um, closely to his name. 
Can you guess what product that is? Yep, Listerine. Uh, this was originally used as a sterilizer for surgical tools, and later you can see it's promoted as a deodorant and a germicide. And of course, now we use it as a mouthwash. So the next time you're rinsing your mouth with Listerine, um, just think that you are using <laughs> a sterilizer for surgical tools in your mouth. Um, yeah. As the 19th century continued on, more and more people came to cities, right? We saw that. And the cities had to adapt to this. So let's take a look at how uh, Paris did this. Um, you know, urban renewal is happening all over. We're going to use Paris as a case example. You recall from the last lecture that in the later revolutions of France, especially the one in 1848, one of the major tactics that revolutionaries used was to barricade up the streets. Here they are barricading them up. And they would kind of make like almost little mini forts in the city, just, you know, causing chaos and disrupting daily life, uh, making it pretty impossible for the French army to come in. And they were able to do this because the streets were narrow, and dark in Paris, just like we would expect, you know, in this city that was a, a medieval city that's slowly becoming now an industrial city. These narrow streets made it, again, difficult to send armies into the city. They also made it difficult to remove things like garbage and other waste. And it was also very dangerous if a fire broke out, let's say, um, because you can Imagine all these buildings close by could spread. Now, when Napoleon III became emperor, he appointed Baron Haussmann to modernize Paris. Um, Baron Haussmann, the Baron is his title, so he's the Baron Haussmann. Um, and what Haussmann did was he knocked down a bunch of medieval and modern buildings and even some of the old city walls of Paris. You know, the, the walls that were confining the city. All of this destruction made way for wide boulevards uh, that he then created a bunch of, a, a network of these wide boulevards throughout the city. Uh, this is the very first boulevard that was created. This is uh, the Rue de Rivoli here. And you can see how much wider it is. There's all kinds of um, carriages here. Uh, and we can see a little bit of green space along here, too. And here's the network of the boulevards. These, the ones in red were the ones that were built by Haussmann during Napoleon III's reign. You can see also these two large green areas on the side uh, that were public parks um, that were created under Haussmann. And there were other parks as well, and like I showed you in the last picture, uh, the boulevards could have some green space on them. So not only are we seeing the layout of the streets changing, we're seeing some adoption of green space in cities, um, to, you know, to for people's pleasure, their leisure, the, the middle class, the lower classes, the people who are working in the factories, uh, to give those type of people some, you know, variety and, and, and some green, right? Uh, I think nature does everybody good. During this time, 600,000 trees were planted in Paris. Um, and like I said, it's to beautify the city, uh, which is important because this is the capital of Napoleon III's French Empire. This large park right here on the right even contained a zoo. Um, and the space for these parks was possible because the city doubled its... Uh, limits by annexing the area around it. So, you know, they were running out of room, they just annexed the area around it. Hausman's already been bulldozing through some of the old walls, um, so Paris is growing outward and upward. New buildings were also being built to help beautify the city. Uh, here is uh, the Palais uh, 
Garnier, which was the Opera House started under Napoleon III and finally finished in 1875. Uh, you'll remember that Napoleon the, the Third is kicked out in 1870, 1871. Um, at the time, this is the largest theater in the world, um, this Palais Garnier. Similar to what was happening in London, Paris also modernized its sewer and water lines. Uh, in fact, sewer tunnels were added under each of the boulevard sidewalks. So not only were those that net was that network um, good for land travel, it also was uh, it also served a purpose for cleaning out the city uh, with these sewer tunnels that were built underneath them. In the 1830s, as steam grew more and more powerful and useful, Western Europe and the United States built railroads in order to connect the cities. Um, this greatly shortened the trips that you know previously had to be made by horse or boat or foot. Uh, and you can see here are some of the railways in Europe, and you can see definitely in Great Britain, just a, a a vast network of railroads. There would be stops made in little towns just outside of the cities, and these little stops would eventually lead to the rise in commuters, those who lived outside of the cities but traveled to work in them. So you kind of alleviate some of the amount of people that you need in the city by having these commuter towns. In 1823, a man named Stanislaw Baudry uh, started a multi-passenger horse-drawn carriage service in the French city of Nantes. This is the same city where the Edict of Nantes was, of course, um, but now it's being used for, or we're talking about it because Stanislaw Baudry invented his multi-passenger horse-drawn carriage service there. Uh, because multiple people rode in it at a time, it only cost you know, a nominally small fee for the people. Uh, before this, only wealthy people could afford to own their own horses and carriage in the city, and e even during this, um, only those people could you know, afford their own horses and carriages. But now, the middle class could afford to ride in this, um, this coach that went along planned routes. This service eventually got the name uh, omnibus, omnibus, meaning for all in Latin. Um, it's actually kind of funny. One of the stops uh, had a shop owned by this man named Omne, which is Latin for all, uh, omnibus being a different thing of it, so a, a different declension of it. Um, so you get this idea of this is that's where it came from, Omne, so all, mean, and then this was a service for all, and the stop was there, so it'd be called, it became the omnibus. In 1828, Baudry moved to Paris, and he brought his omnibus business with him. And by 1829, the next year, the small a similar service sprung up in London as well. Uh, and this is where we get the term bus, right? So the buses that we use in modern times derive from these uh, this omnibus. People would try to make steam omnibuses, but it never really caught on. Um, mainly horses, uh, at least in terms of the early omnibuses, until uh, cars or automobiles came around. In 1863, London built the first subway. No, not the first re subway restaurant, but in fact, the first subway rail line, and this was called the Metropolitan Railway. Um, others would follow this example of putting, you know, their trains underground so that you have more space up top. Uh, and this also kind of explains why so many other countries call their subways metros, right? They're named after the Metropolitan Railway. For example, the metro in France, uh, or in Paris, the metro in Rome. Um, they're all called metros because of the Metropolitan Railway. As electricity became cheaper, Trolley systems began to develop in the 1890s, um, you know, on these steel tracks, steel being another of these innovations. In 
So as we looked at this a little bit before, uh, there was a change in class structure due to the Industrial Revolution as well. Um, in the early 18th century, there was still a continuation of the old rigid class system. You had the nobles who held the land on top, and we'll just throw in the gentry with them too, because they owned land, just not you know the crazy amount that the nobility did. Then there you know, was a small merchant class. Some of those people would have gone up into the nobility. Others would have just made up this small merchant class. Uh, the owners of little shops fit in there, craftsmen. Uh, and then there was basically everybody else. Uh, and obviously there was some people with a bit more than others, you know, the freeholders, the smallholders, um, and then you get the peasants and whatnot below them. And that was really in the early 18th century, so the 1700s, that rigid class structure remained, um, you know, dating back to the, you know, feudal system, even into the Renaissance with the, the merchant class coming in. Um, in the 18th century, this still existed. Now, you'll remember that Marx, you know, who was living through this time of change, was predicting that the Industrial Revolution would bring about two, you know, strongly defined, sharply opposing um, classes, the bourgeoisie and the proletariat, uh, proletariat, and they would be, you know, going against each other. Uh, here's this nice little drawing from study uh, study.com showing our bourgeois versus our proletariat there. Um, but again, as we mentioned earlier, we've said this a couple times, a diff couple different lectures, this view was really just too simplistic. Um, because in reality, there were three classes. Uh, you had the upper class who were the landowners and the industrialists. Um, you know, the bigger businessmen, you had the middle class who bureaucrats can kind of fit into there, lawyers, doctors, um, people who did like technical services in the factories, you know, not working the machines, but, you know, building the machines and whatnot. And then you had the lower class, the factories and farm workers. Um, and in reality, even these classes were these three classes are a bit simplistic. Uh, the middle and lower classes each had subclasses to them. Um, yeah, so even that, even these three classes is a bit simplistic. Over time, the middle class would increase in number, uh, but despite some people, you know, gaining some wealth, uh, there was still a huge wealth disparity. Uh, this top 20% that you see here of the population held over 50% of the wealth. Um, so, you know, a great disparity in wealth was happening during the Industrial Revolution, which really isn't surprising. Industrialization also drove... Uh, scientific improvements um, and discoveries. People began to understand concepts about electricity and when they invented the dynamo um, it became easier uh, to produce and you know easier to use then. So here's the dynamo there. And by the way if you do a, a Google image search for dynamo all you get are pictures of this magician. I don't know who this guy is. I've never heard of him. But doesn't he kind of look like he's like it's Ben Stiller playing, you know, some type of David Blaine character? I don't know who you are, Dynamo, but congratulations for taking over uh, the Google image search when you look up Dynamo. You, you know, overshadowed an amazing invention. Uh, good on you. The field of chemistry also greatly expanded during the Industrial Revolution, due to the Industrial Revolution. Uh, people learned how to turn oil into fuel, like, you know, gasoline, petroleum, and artificial fabrics and dyes as well. Uh, and that's just, you know, the tip of the iceberg of the um, innovations in chemistry.
but these were especially important ones for industrialization, right? Being able to use oil as fuel and you know, the creation of fab fabrics and dyes from it. As people learn more about biology, um, as we've seen, uh, the health fields greatly benefited. Um, you know, think of like Pasteur, who was like a microbiologist, um, you know, and what he thought, what he proposed really helped people live um, healthier lives. So these improvements and evolutions in uh, the cities made it so that, you know, the cities of 1900 were incredibly different than those of earlier cities. Um, these cities had different means of transportation, uh, often including public transportation, things like trolleys, trains, subways, you know, omnibuses that became automobile buses, auto buses, uh, and then even cars starting to, you know, develop um, in a more private sector of transportation. Cities also now had lighting in the streets. Originally, gas lamps were being used, um, but eventually electric lamps would uh, become prevalent in cities because of things like the invention of the dynamo. Um, you know, as electricity became cheaper and more f efficient, the dynamo, um, you know, could then power these electric city lights. And obviously, lit streets make cities safer, make it so you can travel at night, uh, as did new public services like police and fire departments, uh, garbage collection, sewers, and you know, regulations on drinking water so that there were actually supplies of drinking water in cities now. The landscape of cities also really began to change. Um, you know, in 1900, it looked completely different because when the elevator was invented, it became a lot easier for cities to build up. So now we have taller and taller buildings even skyscrapers like this, uh, the Flatiron Building, which was built in 1902 in New York City. Um, so now it became easier to grow up. Uh, and the landscape of, like I said, of cities really was completely different. These, Think about it. Look at this page compared to the very first one when we were looking at the medieval city. Just how... Um, how, 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 how much change uh, occurred in these, you know, couple hundred years um, until basically the way of life and the way that cities existed uh, was completely different. Now, that's where we're going to leave off today. In our next lecture, we're going to look at, we're going to be, again, be in the 19th century, uh, but we're going to look at outside of Europe, um, but still going to be very, it's, we're going to look at what Europeans were doing outside of Europe um, when we see Western Imperialization 1, uh, and then after that, obviously, there will be Western Imperialization 2. But that's next time. This is Greg, signing off.